for more than a year, our Nick Payton Walsh has been reporting on the civil war in Syria, bringing us stories from the streets as well as the front lines, showing us that it is really what it is really like to live amid that bl bloody conflict, that civil war that has torn that country apart. I want you to take a look at this. It's that sound that terrifies ordinary residents of Aleppo daily. Jets coming in low overhead and never knowing really until you hear the blast exactly what their target is. One morning I was just um, speaking on a, a satellite phone for a couple of minutes and the helicopter started swirling around us. We didn't quite know um, why that was. And shortly afterwards uh, the helicopter fired a missile into some nearby buildings and it was um, uh, a house of uh, a family who was sort of all asleep at the time of, of the actual strike. They say the airstrike came in about four hours ago, but still they're racing frantically to pull what they say are nine people still stuck under that rubble, including a father and child. I think the thing which stuck with all of us most was the, uh, the child who was, was born less than a year old, who was sheltered by his, uh, his mother's body. The mother was killed, but he was breastfeeding at the time. Uh, and was able to be pulled out alive from, uh, from the rubble. Well, now, Nick Payton, great work, has been recognized. He just won an Emmy for Outstanding Writing, and he joins us. And, Nick, you know, it's good to see you in person. It's good to see that you're safe. Uh, really telling, uh, very compelling reporting that you did, and especially about that young baby that was breastfeeding as his mother was killed. You saw that. Well, what happened? Well, this airstrike came in, hit the house they were in, and over the hours ahead, because people think these things happen very fast, but it takes hours for the people living in the area around to get to the site, and then it's often a case of using their hands to pull out incredibly heavy pieces of concrete, because when a house collapses, every single pillar, wall, the roof comes in, and just in the most chaotic way imaginable, flattens everything beneath it. So it took time, it took electric drills, you saw there the, the, the saws used, uh, and slowly they started bringing out one child after, after another after another because the whole family had been effectively squashed by much of the rumble. We went to the hospital and eventually saw nine bodies stacked up in the back of a lorry there. The picture you see just there, that's the child um, who was rescued. Her bother, his mother's body was actually sheltering him from the rubble. She was crushed, uh, he was spared, um, and it is a quite remarkable sight we saw to see him being cleaned down of the dust, uh, an orphan. It, it is hard. It's hard to see these pictures. You've seen it in real life, and I imagine that a lot of people there who are living this experience are living it over and over. What, what do you get? What is the sense that you get from them in, in terms of what is it like? Well, this happened 15 months ago, and things have got exponentially worse. I mean, you know, there are hundreds dying every day, 5,000 a month by some counts, uh, a war that has changed completely in characteristics since we did that reporting uh, in September, August of last year. We now have a massive infiltration of al-Qaeda jihadists in the north, in rebel ranks, making it for many journalists, in fact, most journalists, a no-go area. Uh, and we now have a regime which have been on their back foot, many think, for some time, but suddenly regain the narrative by deciding they want to give up their chemical weapons. So a phenomenally confused picture, changing landscapes, and a rebel force that was for so long fractured and is now, frankly, hostile, I think, to many of the people in the West who did want to help them originally, Suzanne. And, Nick, it's not just the Syrians, but that they're also displaced. I mean, they're in Lebanon, they're in Turkey, they're in Iraq. What is it like for those to, you know, who are le leaving their country, they've been forced to leave, do they want to come back? Do they feel like there's a sense of optimism that this in some way can, the horror can end and they can go back home? No, there's no optimism. I mean, the fascinating thing to see is the impact it's having on neighboring countries. It's hard to uh, visualize for people because it's a slow process, but there's 1.4 million, some say, Syrians in Lebanon, a, t a country of only 4 million people. That's changing the makeup of that. There were uh, refugees I've seen in Jordan, the huge Zaatari refugee camp there that seemed to double in size every month you would go back. The last time I was there, there was a bus of men trying to get back into Syria because conditions in that camp were so bad, they wanted to cross back into dangerous territory and take the fight back towards the regime. That's the impact that's living on, and as the conflict gets so increasingly hard mm. to even understand or explain to people, that impact filters into Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and that's what we'll see in the years ahead still playing out. Cesar? Nick, I appreciate, we really appreciate your being here and your reporting. Um, and it's just, just excellent work you do, and it's such an important story. Thank you, Nick. Thanks.